Hello everybody, uh, today I'm going to be talking about ideals. So ideals are uh, pretty interesting structures that um, are subsets of your uh, of a ring, and um, they're pretty unique to rings. Um, they kind of have properties that are, uh, they're, they're not rings themselves, they're not subrings, and they kind of mimic some properties of uh, normal subgroups, but we'll see uh, more of that later. So let's get into the definition. And uh, the problem with defining ideals uh, when your ring is not commutative is that you actually have to sort of uh, separate into left ideals, right ideals, and two-sided ideals. So I'm going to write down the left ideal, and then I'll explain where the word left comes in and how you alter the definition. So um, I'm going to use, a again, a notation J subset with a little i just to denote that uh, J is a subset of R, but is also a ideal of R. And um, the definition is that zero is in J, and if X and Y are in J, and A is in R, then X plus Y is in J. So X is uh, J is closed under addition of its elements, and A times X is in J. So we can take any element in the ideal and multiply it by any element in the ring, and we still end up in the ideal. So J is not only closed under multiplication of its own elements, but it is closed under uh, left multiplication uh, by any element in the ring. So this is where the left comes in, uh, is specifically that we are multiplying on the left. Okay. So again, if your ring is not necessarily commutative, then ax might not equal xa, and so you don't necessarily have right multiplication as well. Um, so when r is commutative, the concepts of left ideal coincide with right ideals and two-sided ideals. So from now on, I'm going to sort of just say ideal. And there's going to be a lot of points where I'm assuming R is commutative. Um, but if I'm not assuming R is commutative and I just say ideal, uh, you can take it to be a left ideal. Um, the results will sort of still work if you just focus on one ideal or the other. Okay. So uh, let's look at an example, um, a, a sort of very trivial example, um, and that is that two ideals always exist in R. Namely, these are the zero ideal, which just consist of the element zero, and the whole ring, R, is an ideal. And so these sets sort of satisfy the ideal condition uh, kind of trivially, right? So for zero, um, well, we have zeros in, in the zero ideal, and um, zero plus zero is zero, so it's closed under addition, and zero times anything is zero, so it's closed by multiplication. So this is actually a, these are both two-sided ideals, right? Um, and so these are called, these are called trivial ideals. And R is also called the unit ideal. And the reason for this terminology is that if x is a unit of r, remember a unit is a multiplicati multiplicatively invertible element, and it's also in an ideal j, 
then x inverse x, which equals 1, is in j. And so a times 1, which equals a, is in j for all a and r. So j equals r. So in other words, um, an ideal is equal to the ring if and only if the ideal contains a, a unit, right? a multiplicatively invertible uh, element. And um, this actually goes to show that in a field, the only ideals are zero in the field. Because uh, if you have, uh, zero is still an ideal, regardless. But if you have a non-zero ideal, um, if j is not equal to zero, then let x be a non-zero element of j, but x is a unit. Because in a field, by definition of a field, every non-zero element is a unit. And so by the above argument, j is equal to the whole field. Okay. So these are um, some, some nice results. Um, another example is that um, in z, the even numbers, which we can denote by 2z, or we'll uh, show in a bit that sometimes this is written as uh, uh, in this notation, which I'll explain in a bit. Um, these are an ideal. Okay, That's because if you add two even numbers, you get an even number. And if you multiply an even by any other integer, you still get an even. So this is indeed an ideal. Um, and we'll come back to the ideals of the integers in a bit. Mm. So the next thing to look at is um, principal ideal. So the principal ideal is if a is an element of your ring, then the principal ideal uh, is denoted by this notation, uh, A in parentheses, and this is just the set of xA for x and r. So the way I've written it, this is a left ideal, right? Um, but of course you can define this to be a right ideal similarly, um, or if you're assuming your ring is commutative, uh, which a lot of people do, then it doesn't matter which way you write this. Uh, but the way I've written it, you have to write a on the right-hand side, because this way, if you multiply by another ring element y, then you have y times x times a, and then y times x is just an element um, in, in r, so this is a in the form of an element of r times a. Okay, so, and then... Obviously, if you add two elements in here, then by the distributive law, you also get another expression in the form of an element of R times A. So this is an ideal. And more generally, you can have an ideal which is generated by some elements. And this is just the set of um, sums of products of ring elements and the generators. Okay. All right, so now let's go back to the integers. The ideals of Z are N the principal ideal of n for n in the natural numbers, and 0. Okay, So when n is 1, then that corresponds to the whole ring. Okay, 
And so let's let's prove this. Okay, so let zero uh, let j be a non-zero ideal in z. Okay. Um, then let a be a non-zero element of j. Since a and minus a are both in j, then j contains a natural number, which I'm defining as positive integers. Uh, some people say zero is a natural number. I'm not using that convention. Okay, so j contains some natural number. Obviously, it's going to contain a lot of natural numbers, but j contains some natural number. So by well ordering, there is a minimal n in both the natural numbers and j. So this is just the smallest natural number in j. And well ordering is a special property of the integers, or the natural numbers rather, um, which I believe might be equivalent to the axiom of choice. And I think you can prove this without the axiom of choice, but um, this is just how, how I am proving it. Okay, so we have some minimal natural number in j, and then we want to show that j is in fact um, the ideal generated by n. Okay, uh, then clearly the ideal generated by n is um, contained in j, right, because uh, we can multiply by n, well since n is in j, we can multiply by anything we can multiply anything with n, and then that's going to be in j, but that's an element of the ideal generated by n, right? So if j is, um, if, uh, if x is in j and x is not in n, Okay, and remember we're dealing with integers here, so we can write x equals pn, or rather, I'll write qn plus r. So this is by the division algorithm. For q and z and uh, r is between 0 and, well, since we're assuming that uh, x is not a multiple of n, r is between 0 and n strictly. But qn is in j, so x minus qn, which equals r, is in j. Then, then r is a smaller natural number in j, which is a contradiction. Thus, uh, j is equal to the principal ideal of n, right? We showed that if x is in j, then x can't possibly be not a multiple of n, because its remainder has to be in j, and that contradicts n being the smallest natural number in j. Okay. So this is sort of an interesting um, result of number theory that can be rephrased in terms of ring theory. And uh, this shows that z is a principal ideal domain. 
which is just a ring where all the ideals are um, principal ideals. Okay. So now let's um, look at some more things we can do with ideals. If J is an ideal of R and X is in R, then X plus J is the set of X plus Y for Y and J. Um, this is usually, uh, usually not an ideal, but I will be making use of this uh, in just a bit, and I'll also be making use of this in either the next video or the video after that, um, because this is actually a coset of J. Right? We can think of this as a coset of J um, in terms of R being, or J being an additive subgroup of R. So this is usually not an ideal, but a additive coset. Um, if L and M are ideals of R, then L plus M, which is the set of X plus Y, where X is an L and Y is an M, is an ideal. Okay, and again, this is one of the cases where uh, if L and M are left ideals, then this is L plus M is a left ideal. Similarly, if L and M are right ideals, then L plus M is a right ideal. Uh, notice that they have to be the same uh, orientation, right? Uh, you can't take a left ideal and a right ideal um, and then add them, and that, that won't be uh, necessarily an ideal. So they have to be sort of the same orientation. And again, this sort of goes to show why dealing with non-commutative rings is really annoying. Uh, they are important in, in some cases, but um, there's a lot of mathematics that only deals with commutative rings. But um, if you think of matrices, you can actually turn, the ma turn matrices into a ring very easily. And matrix multiplication is usually not commutative, but those are obviously very important uh, rings. Okay, so now we are going to prove the Chinese remainder theorem, which says that, um, well, first we need to define if R is commutative, then J1 and J2, which are ideals of R, are coprime. if their sum is equal to R. And in particular, um, there exists J1 and J2, which are in J1 and J2, uh, respectively, such that J1 plus J2 equals 1. Okay, why is that the case? Well, if J1 plus J2 equals R, uh, since 1 is an element of R, um, then there must be uh, elements of J1 and J2 such that they add to, to 1. And also, um, notice that this condition is sufficient for J1 and J2 being coprime because um, the sum. Uh, essentially, this is going to be in the sum of J1 plus J2, but if 1 is in an ideal, then it must be R, right? That ideal must be R. Okay. So now we are going to prove the Chinese remainder theorem, which says that if J1 and J2 are co-prime, oops, co-prime, then for any element
elements A and B in R. There um, exists X, which is the in the intersection of A plus J1 and B plus J2. Okay. So normally this theorem is phrased in terms of the ring being Z, and so J1 and J2 being ideals of Z are just principal ideals, and so uh, this is usually phrased in terms of modular arithmetic because um, the cosets of an ideal in Z are um, sort of the equivalence classes mod n, where n is the generator for that ideal. Um, but it's actually really easy to prove, so uh, let j1 and j2 be elements of j1 and j2, such that j1 plus j2 is equal to 1. Then let x equal a j2 plus b j1. And we claim that x is the required, um, x is, is such an element that it is in the this intersection. So why is that? Essentially we just plug in, um, we use this equation uh, twice in two different ways. So first we write j2 equals 1 minus j1 and we get a times 1 minus j1 plus b j1 which is equal to a plus b minus a j1 and this is certainly in a plus j. Right? Because this is an element of J, because it's a multiple, uh, sorry, this is J1, uh, because J1 is in J1, and this is a multiple of an element of J1. Okay. And we do the similar thing where we write J1 as 1 minus J2, and so this becomes b plus a minus b times j2, which is in b plus j2. And so this ends the proof. So the Chinese remainder theorem is actually very easy to prove once you have the required uh, sort of language to talk about it. It's usually proven in number theory classes, and the, the proof is sometimes a little more confusing. Um, but in the context of ring theory, it's actually pretty simple. Um, there's other formulations of the Chinese remainder theorem, which uh, we don't have the terminology even uh, to talk about yet, but I'll talk about that in later episodes. So the last thing I want to do is talk about two special types of ideals. So again, we're going to be assuming R is commutative. Then P, an ideal of R is prime if A, B in P implies that A is in P or B is in P. In other words, uh, there are no A and B in um that are not both not in P with A, B, in P. Okay. Oh, and we also assume that uh, P is not equal to R. Okay. All right, so what's an example of this? In the integers, the ideal generated by P, where P is a prime number, is a prime ideal. And this is essentially saying that you can't take two elements, or two numbers, which are not multiples of P and multiply them and end up with a multiple of p. And this is true, this is true 
um, one way you can justify it is by by prime factorization, for instance. The second type of um, special ideal that we again assume R is commutative, we say M in, uh, is an ideal of R and M is assumed to be not equal to R, is maximal if M is an I, a sub ideal of J, which is a sub ideal of um, R. This implies J equals M or J equals R. So, in other words, the only ideal which is bigger than M, well, that contains M and is bigger than M is R. And so we'll show that maximal ideals are prime. So why is that? So suppose AB is an M and A is not an M then M is a subset of the ideal, which is the ideal generated plus generated by A plus M. And um, this is strictly bigger than M because this contains A and it also contains all of M, but A is not an M. So this is strictly bigger than than M. So this must be equal to the entire ring. Thus, XA plus M is equal to 1 for some X in R and M in M. And then uh, B is equal to XAB plus MB. But this is an M. Why? Because M is an M and AB is an M. So this is a sum of multiples of elements of M. So this is an M. So we've shown that if AB is an M and A is not an M, then B must be an M. So M is prime. Okay. So that's it for this video, and I hope to see you in the next one.